Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Around the world these days, we've been having these incredible heat waves. And I guess the obvious question to ask is, how hot can it really get? You know, we're seeing temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius, up 70 degrees north latitude, north of the Arctic Circle. And uh, we're having associated drying of vegetation, leading to many different wildfires around the planet, including in California and Greece recently. And the crops are failing, so I expect that there to be uh, food spikes uh, as a result of this. There's lots of implications to humanity from these heat waves. And the question is, how hot can it get? So you may have heard of the term wet bulb temperature. Basically, when the humidity is 100% and the temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, the human body is not able to get rid of heat. It's not able to sweat. So you can be in a well-ventilated area in the shade under these conditions, and you're basically dead after six hours. Your body overheats and shuts down. So we've approached this wet bulb temperature um, in some locations on the planet already um, for short intervals of time. But the question is, as we get more and more warming, as we move forward, what is going to happen in some of the hottest regions? And it turns out that in large parts of China, in the eastern northern plains, um, that's one of the, the areas most at risk of getting, uh, getting large frequencies of occurrence of these wet bulb temperatures. Also parts of the Middle East, also parts of Southern Asia. So that's what I'm going to talk about um, here. So first of all, how does intense heat affect the human body? So once the body temperature, once you reach 35 Celsius, high heat and humidity, it's physically impossible for even the fittest human body to cool itself by sweating. So there's fatal consequences after six hours of these conditions, you're, you're dead basically. Okay, and that's if you're very, very healthy. Of course, the, you know, most people, this would be the ideal health case. You know, the healthiest person would succumb in six hours. The rest of us, would be in much lower time periods or at slightly lower temperatures, slightly lower humidities. So there's a lot of physiological effects. So the brain, the hypothalamus in the brain regulates the body temperature within limits. In extreme heat, chemicals in the brain fall out of balance. There's impaired judgment, irritability, fatigue, slowing down of the whole system. The lungs are stressed there can be lung failure, the heart, the blood vessels dilate, they get wider in an effort to shed heat, increasing the surface area of, 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 of the vessels and they, they, it allows heat dissipation normally. Blood pressure drops when there's dilation, so the heart beats faster to try to reestablish the proper blood pressure that stresses the body. Uh, electrolyte imbalances, there's muscle spasms and cramps, it can be mu in, in, for example, the legs and arm muscles, the skin, heavy sweating can lead to heat rash, ducts on the skin can get blocked, sweat spills over onto surrounding skin, causing irritation and redness. If you have sunburn, that decreases the ability to cope with the heat. And of course, when you reach the wet bulb temperature, you can't sweat at all to remove heat from the body. There's also effects with the kidneys because you're not, um, the heat dehydrates the body. So the kidneys hold more toxins. They don't get rid of the things like, you don't get rid of the urea and ammonium, which is expelled through urination. So you're sweating, you're losing moisture, you're gonna be producing less urine, so the concentration will increase. Um, in your body. The pancreas, there's an imbalance, there's an energy loss, okay, the body's trying to overcome this, um, glucose swings, um, 
no energy flow in cells, liver tissues get damaged, your ability to metabolize food and convert it into energy fails, so you lose your appetite, basically. basically. So you can have all these things as, as a result <coughs> of uh, intense heat. So I just want to remind you, um, after I produce video, a few videos, they generally go up onto my website, paulbeckwith.net. So please have a look at it. Um, and there's lots of other information in the menus. And there's a word search over here. So if you're wondering if I've done a video on any different topics, then you can have a look at the different categories here. You can look at the particular thing, for example, Antarctic. Uh, Antarctic ice shells, etc. Anthropocene. You can click on any of these links and it, these are all links and you can click on them and it will take you to videos where I'm discussing these very topics. I've covered an awful lot of things over the years. Also, uh, please consider uh, chipping in with a donation to on PayPal. You don't need PayPal. You can just have a credit card to uh, to keep me going for, for these videos, which I spent a lot of time and effort trying to produce them to educate the public on the severe risks of abrupt climate change. So this article just came out. There was a peer-reviewed paper um, on unsurvivable heat waves could strike the heart of China by the end of the century, or at least in the time frame 2070 to 2100. And of course, we know things are always happening faster than expected. So the deadliest place on the planet for extreme future heat waves, according to this paper, is the North China Plain. This is one of the most densely populated regions in the world, most important food producing area for China. So China, about 1.4, 1.3, 1 1.4 billion people. Now, these heat waves, if it's very humid and you reach this wet bulb temperature, Healthy people will die within hours, um, basically. You can't, you can't be outside. You have to be inside with air conditioning, okay? So um, basically, uh, this is the region we're talking about, okay? It encompasses a number of major cities. There's basically 400 million people in this region. It's vital to China's food production because it's an alluvial plain. You've got all these, you've got these major rivers running through, they've deposited, deposited sediments, so the soils are very good for farming. But it doesn't get enough rainfall in the winter and spring, so there's irrigation being done. And the irrigation actually adds to the humidity, which makes it more unbearable for, for the farmers. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, paper here. Okay, so the paper just came out in Nature. Okay, North China Plain threatened by deadly heat waves due to climate change and irrigation. Okay, so the irrigation actually it cools the surface temperature, moistens the surface air, but it boosts the integrated. The overall effect is to increase the um, the temperature, humidity, or humidex or the, um, the, the, the uh, misery that comes from these, these heat waves with high humidity. So there's a threshold, um, 31 degrees at 100% humidity, very, very uncomfortable, very difficult to work outside. It's a 35 degrees at 100% where it's fatal. So if it's 45 degrees, that fatal point will be reached at a lower relative humidity. I'll explain that, um, I'll explain that so <clears throat> let's just look at some of the diagrams and results. So this is showing the, um, this is China. This is a particular study region. This is the uh, topography. Um, okay, this is a topographic map. So this is just the topography. So you see the higher elevation regions. You know, this is, this is the elevation in meters. And uh, you can see the higher elevations, the lower elevations, the plain, the alluvial plain here is the area that where all these people are concentrated and it's a very crucial farming area. This is showing the, uh, there's huge amounts of irrigation in this region. So this, um, 
what, what we have is the area equipped for irrigation as a percentage of the surface area, so AEI percentage, and this is in this particular plot. So in this area, for example, the very the purple area is 50 to 75 percent of the land in those regions is irrigated. Okay, um, so all this area here, the greenish area, is uh, anything over 20, 20 to 35, 35 to 50, 50 to 75, all in this region here. Okay, so very heavy irrigation, which adds to the humidity. When the temperature is very hot with the irrigation, you're spraying water in the air, it contributes a lot. Um, this is showing the highest daily maximum wet bulb temperature in the modern record, so 1979 to 2016. So what you can see is you can see that the wet bulb temperatures are reaching these areas here, the darker orange. So about the 30 degree, 30 degree Celsius mark. Okay, so we're not reaching that 35 degrees wet bulb temperature yet, but we're that's the direction that we're heading. And this is the population density in people per square kilometers. So look at this region here. Okay, very, very high population t density in this particular region. Okay, so they run the models to see how the temperature is, the wet bulb temperature maximum will change over time. Okay, so this is the, this is the scale, this is the wet bulb temperature. Okay, so this is the spatial distribution of China, and then focusing on this region, this particular High Plains, North Plains region, um, not High Plains, it's close to sea level, North Plains, north on the northeast of China. Um, and so this is, uh, this is showing the distribution of extreme wet bulb temperatures. Um, okay, so this is with no irrigation historically. Now, this is with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the RCP scenarios, representative concentration pathway 4.5. Okay, this is what, we, what is expected there for the time frame of 2070 to 2100. And this is the high emission case, business as usual case. And what you can see is you can see the wet bulb temperatures being Okay, being in the red, so 33, 34, 35 degrees up in this region here. In, in, in significant regions in the RCP 8.5 scenario. Now this is without irrigation, but when you put air, when you include the effects of irrigation, the wet bulb temperature goes up in all of these regions. So you can see the difference here. But there's the most significant difference is here in the RCP 8.5 scenario, you can see the vast amounts of the red area here as compared to here. So this is in the business as usual scenario with irrigation. That is with irrigation. And you can see, look at this, 33. So this red area is all over 33 degrees wet bulb and the darker red area here is over 34 degrees wet bulb. So we're getting, this is the um, ensemble average. So there's days when you'll peak above this. So this is, uh, th this area is gonna be very, very difficult to work outside in this area and to pr produce the food in this area that, that China will need. Now, this is, uh, there, these are histograms of different cities in this region. So what it does is uh, the models are run for this region. I believe that the different colors are, so the different colors are historical is black line, RCP 4.5 is blue, and the red is 8.5. So the business as usual high emission scenario path that we're on is the red line. And this is showing the frequency of occurrence here. It's a histogram and the temperature that is reached. So anything over 35, so here's 35 here, this goes over, this goes over, this goes over. All of these different cities here, when you combine the urban heat island effect of the cities with the wet bulb temperatures and the humidity, you exceed 35 in, in a lot of these major cities. And this is bad news because people just can't live outside. Thank you for listening.